Good morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, find Jonah chapter 3. That's where we're going to be, um, whether that's in paper form or on a device, Jonah chapter 3. And uh, this is going to be the last part of this series. We're not going to get into Jonah chapter 4, um, not because we don't want to, but because we need to press on as we move into the semester. We're going to start a new series next week called The Collective, uh, where we're going to talk about we grow better together. And we're going to talk about being in a discipleship, a discipling environment. So we're going to talk about that for the next three weeks after this. So we won't get into Jonah chapter 4. Uh, but Jonah chapter 3, find that. And let me review why you're doing that. Um, Jonah is a preacher called by God to go to a, to a city, um, a very violent city, a very powerful, massive city called Nineveh. Right? Jonah receives this call. Jonah says, um, I don't think so. I hate Nineveh. I don't want them to be saved. I'm also kind of scared of them, and I don't, I, so I'm not going there. And so he, he, it, rather than run to Nineveh, he runs from God. And so think Nineveh would be uh, in like maybe modern day Iran, Iraq. Jonah gets on a boat, and he's heading on the Mediterranean Sea toward maybe modern day Spain. So he's running from God. God pursues, there's a storm. Um, the sailors ask Jonah why he caused this. He says, throw me overboard um, because I'm running from the one true God. This storm has, that's the reason for this storm. So they throw him overboard. There's Jonah sinking. There's revival on the boat. Like there's celebration on the boat. They begin to worship the one true God because they see this miraculous, this storm um, stop, right? And so Jonah is sinking um, in the Mediterranean Sea, kind of like we talked about this last week, like, like Jack and the Titanic. You've seen that movie before, right? You know what I'm talking about. And I was thinking about that this week, that kind of comparison. Like the Titanic, I thought about how you could really make this a guy's kind of movie. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the end scene where Jack is... Um, he's turning blue, Rose is floating on this piece of, I don't know, top of the piano or wood. She's dry and she's going to be saved. Jack is freezing, he's turning blue and he lets go. And there's this very like dramatic but romantic scene where he's blue and he's sinking into the water. And this week I was like, you know what would make that scene awesome? Like great white just hits him like this, comes to the surface and just shakes him like a rag doll, like a seal, right? I thought, now that would be worth watching. You know, like it's Shark Week. I had to, I had to, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Air Jaws, Air Jaws hits Jack at the end of the Titanic and we all go, Woo! all the guys go like this and all the ladies cry. So anyway, uh, but I think that's what I like about Jonah. Like Jonah's drifting in the sea and, um, all of a sudden you hear this, like there's this shocking splash and there's this quick breath from a blowhole and this huge tail disappears in the water and then silence. Like there's no movement, Jonah's gone. And so Jonah's sinking, God appoints a large fish, um, we believe to swallow Jonah. And for three days, Jonah's in the belly, the belly of this big fish, but he doesn't get digested. Now there's a lot of scientific research on how this might be possible. Um, some say maybe he didn't end up in the stomach, maybe he ended up in some sort of crop or gullet, like a, a holding area where there's not digestive or gastric juices. Um, but maybe he was in the stomach. Maybe he was in the belly of the whale and he did experience some physical repercussions, which scientists would say his skin would be bleached. Um, all of his hair from the gastric acid would, um, he would lose all his hair all over his body, right? So he would be bald. We're not sure. But what's important is this, what happened in the belly of the whale? What happened while he was there in the great fish? And what happened to Jonah is there's a change of heart, like a brokenness. And we talked about this last week about the fact that God does some of his best work in the belly of the whale. Like in our crisis, in our brokenness, in our seasons of distress or grief, God grows us through those times. And so ultimately what happened in the belly of, for, for Jonah is that um, 
he finally conceded to God. He's in the belly of the big fish and he goes, okay, God, I get it. I repent and I see that this fish isn't my punishment. This fish is actually my rescue. You're not through with me. And so here's how we see it work. The last, we got down to the very last verse of Jonah chapter two. I promise we're gonna get to three in just a minute, but Jonah chapter two, the very last verse that we didn't read last week says this. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And so what we, what we understand then is that when Jonah changed his ways, God changed his mind. Like Jonah surrenders, Jonah commits to God's way, the fish pukes him up on the beach. How's that for imagery, right? And, and this is a very important moment, like him being vomited on, on dry land. This is, a, this is a very important moment, here's why. The beginning of Jonah's mission was his resurrection. Like Jonah's mission began when he was resurrected. So when Jonah changes his ways, he's repenting, he's returning to God, and God works the old Jonah over in the belly, and then he resurrects out of the belly of the well a new Jonah, one that's got a heart for this city of Nineveh, one that's died and, and to self, one that's been resurrected, and one that's ready to go share the gospel to the Ninevites. So the main character of the story is Jonah, but woven throughout the heart of this book is God's love for a city that doesn't necessarily love him. God's love for a group of people who actually hate him and worship other gods. God's love for a people that are evil and um, uh, uh, that are enemies of the rest of the world. Nobody else loves this city but God. Everybody else is afraid, everybody hates this city, but God has grace and he wants to, that he wants to give this city, so Jonah must bring that good news to them. And so we get into chapter three, beginning with verse one, and it says this, when the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now catch that, God, God comes to Jonah in chapter one, Jonah says, no way, it's not a mistake, Jonah doesn't mishear God, Jonah actually runs from God, and but God gives him a second chance. God kind of works him over, but then he gives him a second chance. And so he comes to him a second time, verse two. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. That's an important, that's an important four words, five words there. Because in the first chapter of Jonah, God is very specific about what he wants Jonah to do. In chapter three, when Jonah's now on dry land, it's more of a, it's a very vague uh, instruction. Like in Jonah chapter one, verse two, it says this. It says, um, are we there? Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So he's like, write a sermon, get your thoughts together, go tell them they're wicked. And so like, like Jonah, prepare for this. Well, in in chapter three, he says, go proclaim the message that I give you, right? It's like, like Jonah in the belly of the whale, like his notes and his iPad and all his, you know, all his, ser all his sermons at the bottom of the ocean. So he's spit up on dry land and, and God says, don't take anything. Just show up and I'll give you what it is you need to say. I'll tell you what they need to hear. You'll just be my spokesperson. And so here's Jonah trusting him. Jonah's been transformed. God, whatever you want, wh wherever you send me, and Jonah gets it. Like the gospel, the grace of God has captured him. God, no matter what, no matter where. Mount Washington, a uh, homeless shelter in, in Shepherdsville, downtown Louisville, Guatemala. Like, like this, is, this is Jonah's MO. This is what he's about now. And my question this morning is, is do you find yourself there? Do you find yourself having a heart for certain people? or being called in that way. And, and your call maybe isn't, isn't, you know, Guatemala on a mission trip or downtown Louisville to homeless shelter or, but your call may be to just walk next door to a neighbor and share the gospel or go visit your parents and your family and tell them the good news of Jesus. Like you tell me God where the gospel needs to be preached and I'll be your, amb your ambassador. Are you there yet? Are you finding yourself in that place of surrender with God that you'll do whatever God asks you to do? You'll accept the call of God to share the gospel with people. Chapter three, or verse three, 
It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. So Nineveh is this, Nineveh is a massive city. And even for today's standards, this is a huge city. And most scholars would say that in ancient times, um, it would take um, one full day of walking and you would be able to walk about 20 miles, okay? So it takes Jonah three days to walk through the city. So we think it could have possibly been 60 miles in circumference, possibly. Archaeologists uncover, have uncovered numerous palaces in the dig of Nineveh. And um, it's huge, it's wealthy, and one of the things they found was they found a palace with 70 rooms. It had a library in it that had tablets. The wall surrounding Nineveh might have been 100 feet tall, and in some places it was 24 feet wide. 24 feet wide. This is a massive wall. Like, this city is rich, they are proud, they are arrogant, and they are unfriendly. Like it's a wicked city, they're a wicked people, they're savage, and they savagely kill people in neighboring, in neighboring towns and in neighboring countries, right? So most of us have never experienced a city like this, and this is where God sends Jonah. Now take note of this when it comes to, to Jonah going to Nineveh. God had Jonah go through this grueling time in the belly of this big fish in order to help Jonah die to himself, right? Jonah's already been through something very tough in, in sinking the storm, sinking three days in the belly of a whale. That's pretty grueling stuff and then vomited out on the dry land. That, that's grueling stuff. That's a tough circumstance. And, and I think for some of us, and some, sometimes this even gets preached in by, certain, by some preachers, a lot of us have been told that if you give your life to Christ, once you give your life to Christ, life becomes easy. Like, let me throw this scenario at you. Jonah is purged from the whale, a changed man. And so because he's changed, life gets easy and he can now, because he's, he's vomited on the beach, he can now suntan in a chase lounge with a drink that has an umbrella in it and he can live the easy life with a fat retirement because God is good, right? He's changed and so his reward is to be dropped off at the local Mediterranean resort for some fun and, and sun, right? God dropped him off at the beach. Some preachers would preach that's the way life is when we follow Christ, but that's not what Scripture tells us. We think, we, we, we think that's what life is going to be like when we follow Jesus. If I change, God will give me what I want, money, beauty, and no responsibilities. For Jonah, that's not it, though. Like, life doesn't get all grand and better, and it's important that we understand this. For Jonah, God sends him on mission to the hardest to reach place in the entire universe at that time. This is going to be a difficult work, a difficult work. And so I'm praying as a church we hear this, like salvation, you giving your life to Christ, you dying to yourself, and God redeeming you and resurrecting you, a new creation, one made in his image, that's not the end of the story, and then you at that point have permission to live fat and happy. That's not how it works. That's just the beginning, that's not the end of the story, that's just the beginning of a new story and a new story that if you're truly following Jesus could possibly cost you your life if you really believe it. And that's what's happening to Jonah here. He's risking it all, he's risking his life to go to Nineveh. Verse four, Jonah began by going on a day's journey into the city, proclaiming. This is what he proclaims, right? So he's going into a rough, dangerous city, and this is what he says. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's not a text you want to get, right? That's not a, that's not a text you'd want to get on your phone that you're going to die in 40 days. 
And so what Jonah is doing here is he's saying uh, he walks in and he's not he's not he's not loving and he's not serving the community. Um, although that is one way to help people come to see the love of Jesus, he walks in and he just begins to proclaim this message. In 40 days, God is not happy with you, but God does want to save you. Uh, but in 40 days, if you do not change, He will crush you. You will be crushed. That's not a friendly message. That's not, the kind of, that's not the kind of message anybody wants to get, but it's good news. Here's why it's good news, because God gives them a warning. They know it's coming. In 40 days, this is coming if we don't change. And here's what happens is they respond to it. They get it, and they repent. Jonah 3 verse 5 says, the Ninevites believed God. So he preaches repent or die, and they believe the savage city, massive, powerful, proud, savage city that no one thought would ever change, changes. Jonah walks in, not subtly, but loud and preachy. And he says, repent, repent, because there, there's a holy God that might have grace on you if you repent, if you change. And so Jonah was faithful in what God called him to do. And what happens? Revival happens. Like a fire of revival sweeps through the city because Jonah did what God called him to do. And because he did what God called him to do, Jonah was a spark that lit that city on fire. And there's a lesson to learn here. There's a lesson for us to learn. We can't manipulate and we can't manufacture revival or a changed life. We can't force somebody to change. Our role with the gospel is to decide, our goal isn't to decide when revival or change happens. Our role is just to do what God has called us to do and hope and pray that God does his part as we do our part. That's it, it's that simple. Like for us, we might have written off Nineveh. We might have said, you know what? There is, if we lived at that time, we would have said, there is no way they will ever change. Matter of fact, um, not back then, but today, we've probably said that about certain people or certain people groups. How many of us have written off like Muslim countries? How many of us have written off countries that harbor terrorists? Countries that right now are the enemies of most of the world like North Korea. How many of us have written off certain kinds of people, you know, right here in Mount Washington? You know, yeah, nah, you know, everybody knows them and everybody knows they will never change and we just kind of like our stereotypes, because we stereotype people or because we believe there's, for some people, there is not hope. We just avoid them and nobody ever shares the gospel with them because we think or we speculate that they will not change. And that's what Jonah did in the beginning, right? In chapter one, God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah's like, they're arrogant, they're proud, they won't change. And honestly, I don't want them to change. Like, I'd rather them be crushed by God. And so, because he had this the stereotype because of what he knew about them in their past, he was like, there's no way he began to speculate because he speculated his fear and his pride caused him to run the other way. That's what happens when we speculate. But the Holy Spirit, it, Scripture tells us, opens the eyes of the blind. And our role isn't to speculate, our role is just to share. Our role is just to evangelize like Jonah did because you never know what's going to happen when you share the gospel with someone. Like it's not our job to speculate. It's our job to just tell or to share. Like think about this. Is there ever really a good reason not to share the good news of Jesus with someone? Can you think of a good reason not to tell someone about Jesus? or a holy reason not to tell someone about, uh, about Jesus, right? I think a lot of us, we speculate sometimes about ourselves, like, like I'm just not a people person, or that's not fun for me, or, or I'm, that's just, I, I'm, I'm not good with words, or I might not know the answers if they ask me questions, or they might see me as some kind of religious freak or some kind of weirdo, or they might make fun of me. Like, like when we speculate, we think about how they might respond or how they might think of us. Think about Jonah coming out of the belly of the well and walking into Nineveh. 
what do you think he looked and smelled like when he walked in there, right? Jonah's smelling like bait. And if he's actually in the belly, he's, he's got like that bleached skin. You know what I mean? Like he looks like an alien walking into Nineveh, yet he didn't care what people thought. He didn't speculate. How would they see me? What would they think of me? It's not because for Jonah, it's like it's not about me. It's about them hearing the gospel and them being saved and experiencing the grace of Jesus and the love of the Father. Outside of the belly of the big fish, Jonah didn't speculate or presuppose anything. He just preached, and repentance happened. Like when someone genuinely surrenders, when somebody really gives themselves to Christ, they surrender their life to him, what happens is repentance. There's remorse for my sins. I'm, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm going to walk away from what I've done, and I'm going to begin being obedient and begin living in the way that God calls me to live. Like true belief is always followed by um, uh, always follows repentance. There's repentance, there's belief, there's repentance, and then there's, there's obedience. Jonah chapter, chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says this. So uh, he preaches, um, they believe, and then it says, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, like the whole city, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, it says he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, sackcloth, and then he laid down in the dust. He sat down in the dust. Like, like this is miraculous. This is miraculous that the, the most powerful man of, at that time in the world of this powerful, rich, savage, massive city is now humbling himself, putting on sackcloth, taking off his royal clothes, putting on sackcloth, and sitting in the dust in surrender and repentance to God. Like, this is miraculous. Like, if you know anything about men and power, like, like this is miraculous. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like when it comes to men, I don't care what it is. Like, you make a man a referee in a flag football game. Like you give a man a whistle and a little bit of authority and it can get ugly quick, right? Like, like men, are, we just tend to be power hungry because we want people to tell us or see us as having what it takes. We want people to tell us we have what it takes. And sometimes in order to prove we have what it takes, we have to um, uh, uh, um, uh, oppress other people try to have power over other people and humble other people. We want to hear we have what it takes. And so our pride wells up. So can you imagine the pride of this king, of this savage, massive, wealthy kingdom, what kind of pride he must have had? So this is a miracle that this king humbled himself and surrendered himself to God. Like this would be like Hitler coming to know Christ, honestly. And he doesn't just like, like when he gives his life to Christ, he doesn't just come forward during an invitation song and, and get baptized and then go home and live life as, as like normal. The king humbles himself and then he issues a decree to the whole city to show and prove just how serious he is about this. And here's what he says. Here's what it says in, in verses 7 through 9. It says, this is the proclamation the king issued to all of Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Like this passage shows um, to what degree the king is repentant, right? Like as a sign of our full repentance, so you'll know how serious I am about this. And so God will know how serious we are about this. We will humble ourselves, 
to a point where even our cows and our sheep and our puppies and our chick, whatever it is, so that they will display our remorse and repentance. This is how serious we are. So the king is saying, quit evil, quit violence, quit sinning, quit doing what you've been doing and admit that we're sinful. Like this is the gospel penetrating the heart of the king and all the people of Nineveh. This is revival. And just like with Jonah, when Nineveh changed his ways, when, when Nineveh changed its ways, God changed his mind. God relented. Verse 10, when God saw what the king and, and all of the people in the city did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. As a church, Church of the Crossroads, if there's one reason that we're here, my hope for you being here, my hope for us as a church being in this city, if there's one reason, it's this. It's that our city and your neighbors would be changed and affected and know the gospel through our love and through the message that we bring be through that love. Like, one of my hopes is that this church, this church, very little in the grand scheme of things, has worldwide impact in such a way that Mount Washington, Bullock County, our surrounding region, from here all the way to Guatemala, where Dave and Eric and Terry went a few weeks ago, from here all the way to there, and wherever else we venture, people find themselves hearing the gospel and believing the gospel, turning to God, finding salvation, and in revival, and praising the Lord. Like, like our desire is to have hearts so impacted by Jesus and, and, and the gospel that as individuals, we create a culture of love. We create a culture that looks transformed in the way that Nineveh looked transformed or was transformed. My question for you this morning is, do you have that desire? Like when you wake up in the morning, is the gospel on your mind? When you lay down at night, do you, do you think through your day and, and wonder if you missed opportunities? Do you think through your day and, and, and about how the gospel of Jesus was carried by you to work and to school and to the places you shop? and ate and played? Do you think about when you're on our, your social media or your social media groups, do you think about how you share on there and is the gospel or is the love of Christ being displayed in, in those media groups? Like, are you messengers of the gospel? Are you evangelists, missionaries every day, wherever you go? And for Jonah, his desire, like his desire for Nineveh or to preach the gospel sprang out of his resurrection. Maybe if you aren't thinking about being uh, uh, every day, waking up and being a missionary wherever you go or sharing the gospel wherever you go, if you're not living missional lives, then maybe it's because you don't understand the resurrection. Like it's fully possible, uh, it's possible to not fully grasp the extent of the resurrection or the power of the resurrection of Jesus. It is. Like I think for some, the resurrection they think is just icing on the cake. Like Jesus died for my sins. His resurrection was awesome and just proves how powerful he is. Like that was just icing on the cake to show us. But it's more than just that. The resurrection is more than just that. The resurrection wasn't just for effect to, um, to impress us. It's even more impressive than that. It's also not just to let us know that we get to go to heaven, like we get Jesus, like Jesus defeated death, we get to defeat death, like Jesus goes to heaven, we get to go to heaven. It's way more than that. That's a huge part of it, but proof of eternal life is not the only part of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of a new world and a new way for you. N.T. Wright says it like this. 
It is the point, the resurrection, is the point where the long story of Israel reaches its climax in Jesus and now gives birth, as always intended, to worldwide mission in which the nations are summoned to turn from their idolatry and find forgiveness of sins. It is the unveiling of the prototype of what God is going to accomplish in this world. N.T. Wright's talking about the church. The resurrection was the launching point for the church, a church that has global perspective, right? What did Jesus do right before he ascended to heaven? He gathered the disciples and he said, go tell them all about me. Go tell them all. They all need to hear about this. They all need to hear about me. Be missionaries. Resurrection was the beginning of the mission for Joan. It's the beginning of the mission for the early church and it's the beginning of the mission for you and I. It's the beginning of the mission for Church of the Crossroads. The resurrection calls us to rejoice and it calls us to share in the victory with Nineveh. It calls us to share that victory that Nineveh experienced and that you and I have experienced with Mount Washington, with Bullock County, with our surrounding region, all the way to Guatemala. It calls us to, the resurrection calls us to share our hope at Ford and at GE and at UPS and at UofL and at your school and at, at Scarlet Hope and at a New Hope Pregnancy Resource Center and, and at Mount Washington Community Missions, right? That's why we do those things so that hopefully it, somehow in some way um, people will ask us why we're doing what we're doing and we can say, because you're worth it. And you're worth it because Jesus thinks you're worth it. And here's how we know he died for you. That's the gospel. The resurrection calls us to share the victory we have with unconnected people. And so as a church, we're trying to nurture and develop in all of us a heart for the city. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have community service days. That's why we serve at Dare to Care in the Lions Club. That's why we serve at Mount Washington Community Ministries. That's, that's why we do what we do. One, to help you have a heart for this city and your neighbor. Two, so that they can hear the gospel. They can find forgiveness and find the hope of the resurrection. That's, that is the reason we exist. That is the reason we are here, to connect unconnected people to Jesus so that they can find hope. So this morning, in closing, I had some other things I want to share, but I'd, I'd rather do this. I want us just to spend a few moments praying for our city. For you, it might be, we're going to take a moment of silence, and you pray maybe for that person in your life who doesn't know Jesus, and you've been hoping they would somehow, some way find him. Maybe your prayer is for you having the courage and the desire to share the gospel with them rather than be afraid or rather than speculate what they might say or what they might think about me as I do. So let's pray right now for ourselves, for those who are lost. Maybe a minute of silence and then I'll close with some prayer.